Um, but it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you Joseph Kopser, um, who most importantly is a good friend of mine, but his bio is incredible as well. Um, he is president of Gray Line, which helps companies and public institutions manage disruptive change. Um, he spent about 20 years in the Army, has been very well decorated in doing so, has lectured at West Point, but most recently um, he was the founder of Moval and has been an incredible voice in mobility and smart city uh, area. Uh, he's founded 60 by 30, which is a group that helps the state of Texas lead the nation in new economy and workforce development solutions. And um, what I think is kind of cool is that he's considering a run for Congress in 2018. So Mr. Kopser, welcome to the stage. Do you want slides? Yeah, do you yeah. mind loading sure. this up for a second? You got it. Take it away. So I'm going to stand next to the microphone so they can pick up my voice as well because I understand it's being recorded. Uh, but what I'm going to do is just one. It's the PowerPoint. The picture of my kids, we don't necessarily need to put up. All right. They're good kids, though. Uh, so you know, when Chelsea invited me to this opportunity to come and talk to you all and what you're doing in terms of trying to understand whether it be, hello, Joe, whether it be the Internet of Things and how it all comes together with automation specifically inside of our smart cities, or specifically, it's the one that says gray line. Okay, great. Uh, or specifically in terms of how all these different systems are gonna interact, what I think is important for us to be able to do is understand what I don't see or don't hear being talked about enough during uh, conferences like this, and I go to a lot of them, is the human dimension of this. And so uh, for purposes of background and biography and kind of how it got into the story of what I want to talk about with these 15 minutes, right? Yes. <laughs> is to understand I was in the United States Army for 20 years. No two years in a row ever were the same thing. It was a peacetime army and then it was an army at war. I was in the muddy boots army blowing stuff up and chasing bad guys, but I was also in the academic or institutional side of the army. So I got to see really both sides. If you will, I got to see the organization, but I also get to see the customer itself, which is the soldier, the warfighter, wherever he or she was sent in harm's way. And in all those times, I saw the tensions and the trade-offs between what they needed, the warfighter downrange, and what the institution was able to support. So for the purpose of this discussion, you can change the institution and be your local city government. You can change the institution to be your overall higher headquarters. You can change the institution to be any organization that has the responsibility of developing this ecosystem and bringing it all together. And did you not find it? I have no idea how to use a PC. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it, it's, that, it's that whole macro coming back at us. So yeah, let's see if we right. can. We'll do this. It's the Freeman PC. Does oh, anybody oh, oh. in the room know? <laughs> yep. Thank you. There it is. Removable. Okay. Gray line standard. Great. Look at that, left and right brain. You made me use awesome. both of them today. Fantastic, thanks. No, I don't even get to use all those sides of my brain that much. Um, so I, I was in the Army for 20 years doing all this work, but then at the end of my Army career, what ended up happening was I had just spent 15, 14, 15 months away from my daughters. And I was working in the Pentagon at the time, and all I had to do, all I had to do, was navigate the DC transportation system. And if you've ever been or lived in D.C., you know you have a ton of options, but on the flip side, you have a ton of challenges because you pick the wrong road or you pick the wrong metro line, you're going to be stuck potentially for a long time. And to be at work by 9 a.m., like every other American in this particular context or nearly every other American, I had to be very smart about when I left because otherwise I didn't get to spend the time with my daughters that I wanted to. Because after being gone from them for 14 months, I learned something very quickly about middle school and high school daughters, which is the only time you'll ever see them as a captured audience is at the breakfast table. So I started to create and, and, and optimize an algorithm like so many of you do in your industry, but I wasn't doing it for work, I was doing it for home. And in the process, what I created was an optimization tool that looked at all the different modes and the different costs associated with a commute. And it was such a novel idea at the time that I was actually quite surprised that nobody had invented it yet. Now, Google Maps was doing great things, uh, and there were other individual tools, but nobody put them together. We put them together. We launched, actually, right here in Austin, Texas at South by Southwest 2013, but we didn't publicly launch, really, until Washington, D.C. in November of 13. But the idea caught on quick. In the same way that you all are trying to understand automation, technology, and how you bring it together, 
It's the same case with the history of Ride Scout. But it taught me a number of things along the way, which is that no matter how awesome I thought our idea was, if people weren't using it, it was useless. And what I also learned in this process, that no matter how well intended I was to make people's commutes more efficient, no matter how well intended I was to be able to lower the burden of carbon emissions, to be able to be kinder to the planet, no matter how well intended I was to be using less foreign fuel, foreign sources of oil, because I had just spent time and treasure and lost friends on the battlefield trying to help secure that access to oil, no matter how well intended I was in all those categories, you can't change human behavior as much from the outside as it is from the inside. So that's kind of my worry and my concern as we, together, this community, are bringing so many new technologies to people that some of them, no matter how well intended we are, we're either going to never get it to market because we miss an opportunity because we don't really know what the consumer wants, but more importantly, what I'm becoming more and more concerned with is that we're not doing it in an environment with government being as collaborative as it would, could, and should be. And it's ironic, you know, as I rotate out of Mercedes and create this new company called Grayline, the entire point of Grayline is to use data, to use experts, and actually analyze what's going on to be able to make hard decisions a little bit easier. Because if you create strategy up here at your companies, but the underlying fabric of the ecosystem you live in is being disrupted by autonomous vehicles, if it's being disrupted by 3D printing or advanced materials, if the very foundation of how you built your strategy was built on a world or of a set of technologies that's now outdated, what is that going to do to your strategy? And worse yet, if you have government sometimes working against the use of data or against the use of latest science, it doesn't make it good for anyone else. The best example of this, and the reason why I show this particular slide, not to be shameless just to have my Twitter handle up there, you can use it if you need to. But to be, is to have these four pictures remind me of all of this, which is in that upper left-hand corner. The ecosystem of a city is so hard and complex that it cannot be solved with one particular stovepipe. Uh, you heard the president famously quote about a month ago at the governor's conference, who knew healthcare could be this hard? Well, guess what? A lot of people knew that healthcare was this hard. That's why we've been debating it for years. In fact, it goes all the way back to World War II era when we put a price freeze for wages in place, and then companies had to figure out a way to still be competitive and to draw in talent, and healthcare was a part of that. Now you speed that to modern day, where now we're, we're one of the greatest countries in the world, but we still have millions that are uninsured, even though we think it's the right thing, not everybody agrees. And more importantly, we can't seem to bring all the players to the table. So what that means for us as we're building these ecosystems, specifically in the areas of smart cities, is we, so many of us, know that we can lower the casualty rate. And I call them casualties. 36,000 Americans who die every year in automobile crashes. I don't call them accidents. I call them crashes because an accident is preventable. And in this particular case, we can actually lower the number of deaths if we embrace some of the technologies like autonomous vehicles. But we have a real problem in that by displacing autonomous, by putting in autonomous vehicles, what are we doing? We're taking away jobs from a whole lot of our population that fear losing that job, whether it be truck drivers, taxi cab drivers. Look at your local city council over the last few years as Uber and Lyft took off and the taxi industry responded, not necessarily with saying, that's a fantastic technology, let me embrace that new technology, but instead throwing up barriers, using opportunities inside the arms and levers of government to put up obstacles to prevent those new technologies. So as we talk about these smart cities, it is the human condition as much as it is the technical condition we need to keep in mind. And let me illustrate it with another point that is very timely. In fact, so timely when I was coming in here, I saw the president on television with a whole group of coal miners with him at the White House and paraphrasing what he's doing with the, uh, with the repeal of the clean power plan is that he wants to ensure that we bring coal jobs back. But as anybody who is involved in math, science, analysis knows that the coal industry has been in decline in terms of total number of jobs for a very long time, but those forces had nothing to do with the last president. Many people don't realize this, but peak coal jobs in the United States was 1923. It's been on the decline ever since. Why? Because of technologies that you and your community are creating. 
because of automation and machinery that's doing the work of 20 people with one piece of equipment. And so what you have is a situation where an industry, one particular one, and I'm just using the example of coal, but it could be truck drivers, are being displaced by the technologies and the ecosystems we're creating, leaving them as a vulnerable population feeling that what they must do is speak up, strike out, and make sure that their voice is heard. And just for relative numbers, there's 3,000 coal miners in the state of Ohio. Based on the last election, you would have thought there were 3 million coal miners in Ohio. Based upon the president's new agenda to go against climate change and climate science technologies, you would think that there were 3 million coal miners. But ironically, there are more people in the United States employed today in renewables like wind and solar, more people today than in the coal industry. So it's important as we in this community of technology and science and engineers who are trying to architect all of these brand new plans and these brilliant technologies, of which I'm a huge fan of them, especially sitting through that last presentation. The optimistic opportunity is huge, but it only takes a couple pieces of legislation. It only takes one or two political leaders to get in the way of all of that progress by shutting it down. When you talk about building cities and you talk about the teamwork involved, when the Otis Elevator Company designed the elevator, they allowed cities to grow up instead of growing out. Then years later, after a lot of elevator operator people, mostly men in this particular case, were working these elevator operators' machinery, Otis said, whew, that's the most expensive part of the elevator once you got in place. No different than bus drivers, bus operators, and truck drivers are over time the most expensive piece of a delivery vehicle or a public transit system. So as they were looking to build a lower cost, they invented that digital button board that most people see on any given elevator in America. But it was 40 years from the time of the invention of that technology until it was commonplace that people would get in an elevator without an operator. They would tell the management of that hotel, I'm not getting in this, you need to have a person standing there operating it. And the problem with that is the fact that A, you were protecting jobs, but B, you were protecting a tired or an older tradition, which is let me have somebody operate this elevator. It's the same thing with our automobile fleets, and it's not to be scared or feared, but it's to be embraced to figure out how we do it. And the way they overcame it with the Otis Elevator Company was they put a woman's voice in the elevator, going up, going down, and then that made people feel more comfortable. And then they started to use elevators without having a, uh, an elevator operator. The same thing is going to be impacting so many of our technologies. You can't walk the plant of a modern technology company in the United States today and see more robots than humans. But you're always going to need to see those skills. You're going to need to see those skills because to even understand the complexity of what you're talking about requires an understanding of ecosystems, of understanding the technology, of the network, of the Wi-Fi. It is more than, today, going to require more than just a high school education. And when you look at the early 1970s, 25% of all jobs required a high school education. And beyond that, you had a three out of four chance of getting a good job, feeding your family, and having a happy life. But by the year 2030, nearly 60% of all jobs will require some kind of a certification degree or advanced training. And so what I tell groups a lot, and, and Chelsea knows this has been all a part of what's been driving me over the last year or two, is to make people understand that while all these technologies are wonderful and they are going to enhance our lives and they will save lives, they also provide the rallying cry for certain groups to use them as a reason to justify old systems. They will use them to create division in the same way that the president today marched out a group of 10, 12 coal miners in the White House to say that the clean coal or the clean energy plan or the clean power plan needs to go because these jobs need to come back. Ignoring the reality of it, there was natural gas prices going through the floor that has hurt the coal industry. It is automation and technology that has pushed jobs out of the coal industry. And so it's our responsibility just as much as it is to invent these technologies and to develop them and to test them as it is to understand the impact on society. So the last thing I'll leave you with is this is what I get to do now full time. This is what Gray Line is all about. I've met many of you all. I've seen you at different conferences, and I was always working on one particular issue. Now, 
The topic is not just the ecosystems and smart cities, but it's how we become smart about not just smart cities, but smart communities and rural America. And the really neat part is the American dream, while some people say it's over, I think it's been never brighter as it is today. More access to tools, a lower starting capital cost for anybody starting new companies and business, especially in the technology and software world, means that there is an even better opportunity for the American dream as long as everyone still feels connected to it. So I'm going to stick around for a few minutes. Chelsea's getting closer and closer, which tells me my time is almost over. I appreciate what you all are doing here with this, but don't forget about the human side of it, the people part of why we're doing all these projects. And I thank you for having me here today. Thank you very much.